Mr. President, um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Governor's Seminar when we'll be discussing policies to support Asia's rebound. As you can see, that it's recover, reconnect and reform. We've got a range of uh, issues we're going to be uh, discussing, but it's also important for you to recognize that you are also very much part of this discussion and you can submit your questions via the pigeonhole live. Let me remind you how that's used. It's a very simple um, system. It's an interactive mobile website where you can submit questions and you can also vote on any questions that interest you. So if you have a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop computer with you, just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. And then next you key in our um, event passcode, which is Incheon 2023, no spaces and capital letters. So that's once again, that's Incheon 2023. Um, and the URL and event passcode can also be found on the tent cards on your tables if you've got those in front of you and the questions with the highest number of votes stand the best chance of being presented to um, the panel um, now you know it seems that uh, no longer was the world and the region recovering from covid then we were hit with the uh, ukraine war and of course all the global consequences that that has had and then um, that of course sent shockwaves throughout the world and then we saw how high inflation and high interest rates are very much depressing demand and growth um, in, in the region, which has led to capital outflows and de depreciations in the Asia Pacific region. And as if that wasn't enough, we've also got lots of questions being raised about multilateralism and global governance and also, of course, the urgent need to do something about climate change. So plenty to talk about with my um, marvellous panel here. And I'm going to start with our host nation. It's been wonderful to be in your beautiful uh, country, uh, Mr. Chang Yong Ri. You, of course, are the alternate governor for the Republic of Korea. You're also a member of the board of directors of the Bank for International Settlements. And you've got more than 30 years of experience as, um, across in, several fields as an economist. You have a PhD from Harvard. You've published a great deal. You've worked in academia. You've worked in um, held official positions and um, you've also been a regional director at the IMF and you know the Asian Development Bank well because you were a chief economist here. So um, you should know all the answers then. Um, now listen, the surge in um, inflation in advanced economies has led to a sharp tightening of uh, monetary policy last year, including in developing Asia. So I want you perhaps to set the scene for us and tell us what are the risks that further tightening could delay the recovery and rebound. Yeah, thank you for the general, generous introduction. But first of all, I think it's really great to have this face-to-face -face meeting in Incheon. And as you mentioned, I think as for the challenges, I think Asian economies in general is doing much better than the other region. And uh, it's very important for us to, be a mo to remain as most dynamic region, despite the global headwind that you mentioned, continued tight monetary policy, geopolitical fragmentation, and uh, banking stress in advanced economies. For the uh, continued tight monetary policy, I think it can cause uh, 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 effects pressure and capital out outflow pressure in the region. But I think the impact will be milder than last year because the tightening monetary policy in advanced economies seems to be uh, closing to the end. We are actually watching uh, for the FOMC and the ECB decision this week. And also, uh, you know, the, you know what is, it will be quite different from the last year where the U.S. actually raised the interest rate 75 BPs for consecutive time. But we need to be prepared for the chance that the high interest rate may stay longer than the, what market is currently expecting. And as for the geopolitical fragmentation, I think first important thing is to end the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, which was the root cause of many uncertainties. As for the banking stress, I think that the impact from the banking stress in advanced economies has been quite limited in Asia because we, didn't, we do not have uh, much exposure to them. At the same time, 
our banking structure is quite different. But on the other hand, we need to pay attention to the fact that uh, uh, you know, the deposit is no longer a stable source of funding as shown by the Silicon Valley Bank events. And probably we have to study what implication it has in our regulatory and supervisionary framework such as uh, banking resolution, uh, emergency lending facilities and deposit insurance. Right, interesting. So you've identified some very clear risks there. But just picking up on that last one, what, what, what kind of policies mm -hmm. could you actually implement to, for, for to tackle the, these issues? The, the banking stress. Yes. Actually, I think uh, I, I'm not saying that we have a uh, risk at this moment because unlike the U.S., most of the bonds, government bonds, especially in Asia, has a shorter duration. And uh, we have more floating rate loans rather than fixed rate. Uh, uh, rate loans so that interest hike uh, has a less limited impact on the, our price of the, our securities. On the other hand, our digital banking is more well developed. So we have to be prepared for the right. uh, fast uh, uh, withdrawal of the, our deposits. So we have to, as I mentioned, focus on the, how we're going to revamp our regulatory framework. At the same time, you know, the strong supervision and uh, you know, regulation mm. or our bank, mm. and especially non-banking institution, that will be a very important homework to do. Right, okay. And I'm guessing you don't want to tackle what you do about the geopolitical uh, risk that you just raised, mm. but uh, any other policies that you think we, that the region needs to take in response to the other risks you've identified? You know, it's very hard for me to say one size fits all policy recommendation because mm. Asia is quite heterogeneous. Mm. For example, our two giant, China and India, uh, you know, China and the Japan uh, has quite different uh, you know, environment at this moment. They have a low inflation, they will continue to the lose monetary policy. On the other hand, many uh, other Asian economies has now have different pressure depending on the, whether they are commodity exporters or importers because this time the shock is a combination of strong dollar as well as a high energy prices. So overall, it's very hard to say uh, uh, you know, what is the one policy that we can do. But I want to emphasize that advanced economies and after 19, uh, 2008 global financial crisis relied heavily on monetary and fiscal policy to revamp their economies. Our, our theme is rebounding Asia. I hope that we can use monetary and fiscal policy temporarily, but we should not make a mistake to use the monetary and fiscal policy to enhance growth rate structurally. Right. We need to focus on structural reform. Yeah. That is an important lesson that we learned from the advanced economies. Right, very interesting. And you're quite right to say, of course, you can't have a heterogeneous, it's a heterogeneous region, and indeed developing Asia has been affected much more, of course, than the more advanced economies in the region. So let me come to you, Sri Mulyani Indrawati. You are the governor for Indonesia, You're also minister of finance um, in Indonesia. This is your second stint because you were there um, just before the financial crisis around 2005, I think, and then in 2010, you went off to the World Bank to be managing director there and then went back to Indonesia in 2016 to resume your role at the Ministry of Finance. So uh, how do you think policymakers such as yourself can support multilateralism to ward off the risks of global fracturing because that's a big preoccupation for everybody at the moment. Well, thank you so much, uh, Zainab. Uh, if we just look back three years ago when uh, the world facing with the pandemic, uh, this is the kind of challenge or shock which uh, no one country can actually address this issue. The nature of this kind of uh, shock is actually becoming more and more uh, frequent. We have climate change, we have pandemic, we also have, for example, conflict, which is creating refugees, or in this case, the spillover of any conflict, which is translated into high food price, energy price, then becoming an inflation. What I'm saying is that the world is becoming so interconnected, and the nature of the global economic shock will not discriminate any country, whether you are advanced country, you are emerging country, or developing country. It is not also discriminating you, whether you are in Africa, Asia, or Europe in this case. So multilateralism is the only way for us to work together to address this kind of uh, uh, issue or challenge. How the policymaker is going to support multilateralism? First, you have to believe in this multilateralism. The first foundation of multilateralism 
is uh, cooperation. So whether you have the ability to cooperate and working together, I think that's going to be the most important part. That is going to be your policy or politics, global politics, making sure that this kind of cooperation is going to be established. And within that context, then you are going to look at what kind of the real actual multilateralism which is there in the world. Of course, you have ADB, this is one uh, example of the multilateralism, which is scope on Asia. We have World Bank, we have African Development Bank, we have Latin America, Inter-American Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, and others in this case. For this multilateralism to work is, for, of course, their source of funding, because will create ability, instrument, and resources to help the member country to achieve or to address the issue, for example, like pandemic or climate change. So resources is very important, and that's why the contribution is very important. But in order for this multilateralism to work effectively, you need to have the trust and confidence. So in this case, it's very important for you to be effective. Governance should be also accepted, legitimate enough, so that they are going to be able to be effectively operated. Very interesting. So clearly you need international, regional cooperation and so on to overcome the risks. But what are you doing specifically in Indonesia? Well, first, Indonesia is a member of all this multilateralism uh, institution. World Bank, IMF, uh, ADB, a regional development bank like ADB, AIIB, or we have the Islamic Development Bank in this case. And we also, in this case, as a both shareholder and borrower, we play a positive and constructive role. As a country, as a member country, we also have a development experience that we can actually share with others because multilateral institution is not only about financing. Knowledge and development experience is also important. This will make all countries can work together on how we can see other country experience and how we are going to be able to learn faster so that we are not uh, going to be able, uh, we are not uh, in the position that you have to, to start from scratch. And then uh, for Indonesia in this case, when we play a role as, for example, in the G20 presidency, we try to create an environment in which this cooperation becoming the most important message. Last year, Indonesia, uh, as a presidency of the G20, it was not an easy time, just like uh, Nirmal at today in uh, also managing the G20 as a forum of co cooperation. We try to use all the Indonesia own uh, influence and network and good relationship to create this kind of collaboration. This year, Indonesia is the ASEAN chair, and we use the same spirit of cooperation, uh, including the ASEAN plus three, in which yesterday we, we worked together, ASEAN 10 country plus three, that means Japan, South Korea, and also uh, China. So this kind of spirit is always becoming one of the most important for us to show to the neighboring country, to the world, so that we are going to be able to continue making sure that the cooperation is the best and the strongest message. Thank you very much indeed, Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Let me come to you, um, Honorable Nirmala Sitharaman. You are the governor uh, for India. You're also the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs. You've held previous portfolios, the Minister of Commerce and Industry, as well as Defence Minister, so uh, quite a range of experience there. But just um, picking up on what Sri Mulyani Indrawati said there, I mean, clearly there are short and long-term measures that we need for, um, to support um, Asia's rebound. So how can the regions, authorities, best sort of perform this balancing act? You've got to be a bit of a juggler between interventions needed to manage the economic recovery whilst at the same time trying to boost growth? Um, complex situation, put in simple good words as a question. Um, I think uh, the kind of trials and tribulations all of us have faced in the last few years make us think of responses which are necessary for the immediate context and also plan for the long term because the long term is not too far away. So when you're looking at immediate response, it's to make sure that vulnerable sections are protected. That's absolutely critical. We saw that during the COVID time, 
we are seeing it even with the food insecurity playing havoc in many parts of the world. So you're ensuring inclusivity by hand-holding the vulnerable sections, which means governments and their borrowing and their debt are all going to increase because within your resources to stretch the kind of things that you have to do for bringing in inclusivity is going to take a toll. So knowingly you will get into a situation of high debt. That's the immediate which you can't avoid. Second, you also have to be conscious about uh, supply side constraints. You have to act on them, which is what we did du during the COVID and also during uh, the post-COVID recovery period. So the long and short of your short-term measures will have to keep in mind that unless the recovery is full, aiming at a high growth trajectory is not possible. And unless you have a high growth trajectory that you want to uh, you know, jump onto and then sustain it, you really cannot recover fully. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation. Mm. But for that, you want to make sure the vulnerable sections are taken care of first. Second, you want to make sure also that your central bank, which is what I'm glad that India's central bank did, your central bank makes sure that the synchronizing of interest rate management, not always, and I'm glad you mentioned it when you um, gave your first intervention, synchronizing is always not conducive, and particularly the Asian economies have realized post the 2008 global financial crisis that each country's uniqueness and peculiarities will have to be understood to support. So the MSMEs will have to be supported even as you manage your interest rates because I can say this of India in particular with confidence, but I'm sure many of the Southeast Asian economies do also have a large number of micro, medium, family-run businesses which cannot be given explanation saying interest rates have gone up somewhere, I need to follow. So mm. you have to tailor that. Now having gone into a debt situation, because you wanted to make sure your vulnerable sections are pro protected, you will have to also have a glide path so that your deficit management can speak for itself for the long term. Yeah. So it, it involves quite a few institutions to work together. So when Sri Mulyani said rightly, that under India's G20 presidency, we are aiming to talk to every country to come together to give solutions, taking the classic example of the crypto asset management. Mm. But that's the truth for every other thing as well. Unless countries understand how we are all interlocked in this process, and we take steps to gradually understand how we come out of it, like the way countries are now sucking out that excess liquidity which was pumped into the economies during the lockdown, and immediately after that as well. Unless that is done quickly, your inflation management will depend on only on that tool of interest rate. And if you had managed it better, sucking that excess liquidity mm. back into the economy better, interest rate management will not be the only tool. You can manage it through very many other things. And that way you're able to contain inflation. Very interesting. I mean, you've raised a lot there and uh, bringing up debt, of course, countries like Sri Lanka, huge problem there. And also the importance of bringing SMEs into the global That's supply true. chain. I mean, you focus very much there on the short term. You mentioned one or two things maybe in the long term, but is there anything in the long term that needs to be done to achieve this balancing act? Although I'm trying to generalize, and my generalization, I'm trying to package it in a very effective way, I'm sort of confident that it will be applicable for advanced as well as for developing economies, emerging markets as well. But of course, the voice in the South will have to have a different solution, largely African island countries of the Pacific and so on. So I'll place it simply for our understanding. Four eyes in, in um, infrastructure, which will create more jobs, in-situ jobs, also trigger off the core industries. So infrastructure for your long term. Investment, again, to fund the infrastructure activity. In investments, wherever you can get good investments, on which there is a private sector investment involvement as well, which is a separate thing we may talk a bit later. So the first eye is invest, uh, infrastructure, second eye is in investment. A third eye 
which I think the Southeast Asian nations can feel very proud of, India can feel proud of, the spurt in the number of startups. Because the third eye that I'm talking about is innovation. Unless you have innovative thoughts to address your local <laughs> problems and encourage your local youth to come up with solutions, you are spreading yourselves too thin in terms of paying royalties, paying also solutions which may not fit your own economies and so on. So third is your innovation. And the fourth is inclusivity. Unless people who cannot get into these three rings are also kept included in scheme of things, you will constantly have that conflict in the society which none of us can avoid. So the four eyes for the long term right. and in which private sector involvement, not just public spending. Of course, India in the last three, four years has spent in trillions yeah. uh, for infrastructure. Sure. And ADB is quite of conscious of India's role on that. So long term depends I don't on think the four eyes. I would disagree with those four eyes on this panel where I'm sure in the audience. So you've got it there. Infrastructure, investment, innovation and inclusivity. We all signed up to those four eyes? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sure you are. So um, let me come to you, Neil Zanen. You're the governor for um, Germany. You're also a member of the German Bundestag and you're the parliamentary state secretary to the Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and development and before that you were a minister of state at the foreign office and prior to that you were the spokesperson on foreign affairs for the social democratic party parliamentary group in the bundestag <clears throat> so we, we heard from um our honorable sid Haraman about the short term and the long term but as countries continue to try to tackle you know the issues um in the short term the short-term shocks they've also got to address the longer term issues as we've just been discussing but one long-term issue that i want to pick up with you is the transition to net zero carbon emissions and specifically how should multilateralism or multilateral development banks such as the adb support their members in what is increasingly becoming a very complex environment yeah. well yeah first of all thank you and um i believe talking about net zero and the climate challenge it is both it's a short-term challenge because i think if i look around here i see so many representatives from countries directly affected by climate yeah. climate crisis i mean there are still parts of pakistan that are still struggling with the flooding and that needs to be addressed but we know about the long-term perspective and so what we believe is that we all need to step up and we all means the governments but certainly the multilateral development banks and i am um, happy that president massa will address uh, this audience uh, i think after me and uh, you made a very big promise in glasgow uh, and i think adb has been stepping up its climate um, effort uh, but, but we believe that, you know, um, we all need to do better and there are many things that we are discussing um, on this forum here and at, at the annual meeting. Um, but this is not exclusively directing to the ADB. There is an evolution roadmap that the World Bank is discussing. Uh, we are looking at how can we implement the capital equity uh, framework recommendations, how can we um, also generate more momentum in that reform discussion. And Asia as a region has a very significant role to play because, uh, because of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, we see that all our economies are affected by the global crisis. And as the governor from Indonesia just said, we need more cooperation right now. That's what it's needed. It's going to be more difficult under those geopolitical circumstances. And I believe the climate crisis is probably the most urgent question, but it should also be that one question where in spite of all political differences, we all can agree because we are all affected. And, and that's somehow where, you know, words are not enough. And that's why we need to use the multilateral banks. We need to use forwards like the G7 presidency, which Germany did, the G20 presidency, which we are wholeheartedly supporting. 
Um, but time is running out, so it's really a question of action now. Yeah, so you talk about the multilateral development banks, which of course was the question I asked you, but the role of the private sector is also very important, isn't it? I mean, either on their own, or we hear a lot about blended finance between public and private sector money, so perhaps a word from you on the role of the private sector in achieving these goals. Yeah, look, we need to be honest here. Um, official development assistance is and remains crucial. And I understand and I think it's legitimate that there is a demand towards the developed countries. And we need to work with, you know, our responsibility. We all under very difficult budgetary um, conditions right now. But even if we would be able to significantly step up, ODA alone is not going to do the trick. So we need to mobilize private capital. But we're having that discussion for like 10, 20 years, and we have not been able efficiently enough to mobilize private capital to the most affected countries that we are talking about. And I, I think there is a danger and there are questions being asked toward you know, the MDB reforms. Is your climate emphasis in the West having an effect on poverty reduction. And we need to make sure that this is not being seen as a contradiction. And that's why I believe instruments like, like um, hybrid capital, for example, mobilizing private um, equity, uh, giving certain guarantees in specific areas is going to be crucial. That is going to be something that we need to discuss mm -hmm. and where we need to come up with maybe a new broad consensus. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Masatsugu Asakawa, of course, you're president and chairperson of the board of directors at the ADB. You've been in this role since uh, January 2020, but you've also had a long stint working in, um, in your native Japan, special advisor to Japan's prime minister and finance minister. You also had stints at the IMF and the OECD. And, um, You've listened to what your fellow panelists have said, but I want to specifically ask you about what, um, following on from Niels Annen, about climate change, and to ask you how Asia's growth model can be more closely aligned with its climate commitments, because that's absolutely critical. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Zena. Well, uh, I think everybody would agree uh, with the statement that the face of growth and industrialization uh, in Asia has been remarkable uh, by taking advantage of the free and open uh, trade and investment uh, system globally. Uh, and actually, as, as Asia has become an economic powerhouse serving growing demand worldwide for goods and services uh, through its connections to global value chains, and international trade and foreign direct investment have been key uh, to this transformation. But at the same time, we need to be reminded uh, that the uh, region's industrialization uh, has come with uh, environmental costs, as, as Zeno just mentioned. Asia's carbon footprint has increased dramatically as uh, production expanded to meet global demand. Uh, carbon emission in Asia has tripled, tripled since 1995. Asia now generates around 50% at least 50% of the global carbon dioxide emissions. That's the truth. And another truth is the region is bearing the brunt of more frequent and severe climate events. So, Asia and the Pacific needs to embrace uh, climate smart policies, definitely. This will ensure trade and investment are part of the climate solution. Let me highlight uh, briefly, four key pillars to help align economic growth with climate commitments. First, we should promote trade and investment in climate-friendly goods and services. This includes renewable and resource-efficient uh, energy, uh, which are becoming more affordable, and environmental services, such as engineering advice on the placement and installation of renewables, uh, which are an an untapped opportunity for the region. Second, we should not nurture uh, green businesses uh, through appropriate uh, regulations, standards, and incentives. The region should support 
uh, responsible business systems, uh, better management practices, and innovation to adopt uh, cleaner technologies. We should also ensure uh, these tools are within reach of smaller firms as well. And third, we need to make regional and international cooperation greener. Uh, this can be done in two ways. First, by expanding climate change provisions in regional trade and investment agreements, as many as possible. Uh, this can include implementation and enforcement measures. And second, by exploring innovative cooperation schemes, this can include so-called green economy agreements uh, that give legal standing to green industrial policy objectives. And fourth, we need to develop carbon pricing mechanisms uh, that are effective and just a global momentum for a carbon tax or emission trading system is growing, but Asia has yet to seize this fully. I do believe that the global carbon pricing mechanism will result in substantial, substantially reduce our carbon emissions and it, and it will address carbon, so-called carbon leakage problem across the borders. Very interesting, the four pillars there and very much the carbon market and carbon pricing is very much under discussion globally, isn't it? You know, in Africa and in the region here as well. Um, we're getting questions from all of you, which is absolutely wonderful, so please keep them coming. Um, there's one which has got quite a few votes, and it's specifically to you, actually, Mr. President, because it's asking, what is the ADB doing specifically to help Asia achieve its green transition, which follows on from your four pillars there? So I don't know if you want to spell out on your answer on this one. What is the ADB doing to help Asia achieve its green transition? Okay. ADB has been very active on climate action uh, as much as possible. Uh, and also, I know uh, that the MDB is under enormous pressure uh, to invest more and more in uh, climate investment. And uh, we have decided a couple of things uh, to respond to that kind of request. First, uh, as you, some of you might know it, uh, ADB already uh, elevated our ambition uh, from $80 billion to $100 billion of cumulative uh, climate financing uh, from 2019 to 2030 for those 12 years. And uh, if you divide $100 billion by 12 years, you will come up with simply $8.3 billion per year on average, on simple average. And our actual uh, 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 climate investment in 2021 in the midst of the uh, corona crisis uh, was 3.5 billion, so far below our in the target. Uh, but uh, in 2022, uh, last year, it went up to 6.7 billion. And this year, 2023, uh, when I looked at uh, our pipeline of uh, invest, uh, finance, uh, climate investment, I'm quite sure our achievement, uh, our investment will uh, 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 be close uh, to $8 billion. Mm. So we will you know, make our every effort uh, to achieve uh, $100 billion ambitions. And also please be reminded that we are also, also uh, committed at investing at least one third of $100 billion ambition on adaptation. So $34 billion at least uh, should be invested in adaptation. And our, our investment in adaptation has been also growing. That's one thing. Yes. Second thing. Uh, we officially decided to withdraw our financing uh, from new coal-fired power plants, so we won't do it anymore. But the problem still remains, uh, which, what, which is, in our vision, still, you know, there are so many already existing and operating uh, coal-fired power plants uh, everywhere. Uh, so, and they are relatively young. In this world, young means less than 20 years, 20 years old. I was surprised to know that 90% of young coal-fired power plants are located here in Asia and Pacific region. So and, uh, if we don't do anything, uh, those uh, plants just stay on for another 10 years, 20 years, and even 30 years. So we, are not, we, we have been working on one very innovative financial mechanism called ETM. I don't know if you ever heard of this or not, but the ETM stands for uh, Energy Transition Mechanism. Uh, which is a blended financing uh, to let uh, existing uh, coal-fired power plant to retire early, earlier than um, originally scheduled. And I'm very proud 
uh, to report to you that in the, in the, in the margin of uh, G20 uh, summit meeting in Bali last mm -hmm. year, uh, in, in, cons in close uh, co collaboration with the Indonesian government, especially uh, Minister Sri Muriani, yeah. uh, we could sign one MOU uh, to specify one specific you know, uh, coal power plant in Indonesia to be retired early under this ETN. Sure. Uh, and you've also got a big launch tomorrow, I think, of IFCAP, <laughs> haven't you? Yeah, Just that's... a quick word on that. I know you'll be saying more about it tomorrow. The innovative finance facility for Asia and the Pacific. Yeah, it's, 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 it's called IFCAP, IFCAP yeah. uh, which is another you know, very innovative financing uh, instrument we are, we, mm -hmm. we are we're working on right now. And uh, we are aiming at uh, launching it at tomorrow uh, here in, in Chon, uh, which is an uh, instrument, financial instrument, uh, to increase okay. ADB's uh, 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 climate uh, investment by utilizing guarantees, uh, guarantees by the donors. And uh, the beauty of this mechanism is if one dollar of uh, ADB's operation is guaranteed by anybody, uh, uh, any, any, any donors, we can expand uh, in our calculation five dollars of you know, investment financing. So it's leveraged. Leverage ratio is one to five. Right. So this is a very first you know, mm. you know, financial instrument uh, which uh, utilizes, utilizing uh, guarantee mechanism uh, uh, to, to leverage our, you know, our uh, financing investment. So that you'll have to attend the launch to find out more about IFCAP <laughs> then, isn't that correct? Good. So we are getting questions, please get, get them coming in. Um, uh, uh, Governor uh, uh, Rhee, I just want to... Um, Put this one to you. You'd already talked about the bank failures in the US and Europe. You know, we've had um, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank in the, in the US, First Bank, and then, of course, Credit Suisse under pressure and bought up by UBS or absorbed. Uh, a quick question here. Have developed countries done enough to contain the effects on other banks? I think that uh, if, you, if you look back, well, how the US uh, deposit insurance and uh, you know, Federal Reserve Bank actually handled uh, Silicon Valley Bank within a very short period of time. And uh, one day take over by, uh, you know, the uh, S, uh, you know, standard, you know, you know, the Swiss Bank, I think that was an enormous achievement in my opinion. Yeah. I think it will be very difficult. It could have been a much more bigger events if they actually delayed the response. Right. So in some sense, I think they did the right thing. And whether this is going to really, uh, you know, come down uh, things, I think it's now since the situation seems to be much more settled. Definitely we see this week there is a little bit more spread uh, for the other regional bank in the United States. But I think that uh, uh, you know, the current situation seems to be going in the right direction. On right. the other hand, it remains, it leaves a lot of homework to do. Right, okay. And, and one uh, thing that was underscoring what, what President Massa was saying in the transition to a green economy, uh, you've got to have fairness, haven't you, uh, particularly for people in the labour force who may lose their jobs. And we've got one question here, which is how can countries support workers who will lose their jobs in the shift to net zero? I think you perhaps talked about uh, jobs and so on in the economy. Would you like to pick that one up? Um, yes, it is always a, a balancing act. Yeah. Particularly for a country like India where the population is very high and the youth component of our population is even better in favor of the country. So you have to constantly keep balancing on your priorities for greening your economy. At the same time, even as you're bringing in technology, yeah. the fear that technology will re replace human hand is real and live. Mm. So it is important for us to equally, as much as we see the benefits of technology, as much as we see the transition to the greening yeah. is important, we also have to design some economy, some layers in the economy which will be labor intensive yeah. and provide them that skills. Yeah. Even at this, at this stage as I'm talking, Industries in India are very rapidly resetting themselves to bring in the Web3 to move over to Industry 4.0. Now, if the existing labor remain where they are, they are not going to be upskilled to meet up with these technology infusion. Yeah. There will be a crisis even for the manufacturer. Yeah. So will be his next generation uh, of workers. Yeah. So, garments of the day 
together with industry, will have to constantly, even as they balance this, yeah. climate versus, yeah. you know, uh, productivity, yeah. move and uh, invest more towards greening, you yeah. have to, on the other side, bring in skill sets which are required yeah. for a more technology-driven society. Of course, yeah. And that is where you will bring these workers. Yeah. I mean, as those coal mines are all being retired early in places such as Indonesia and so on, you need that upskilling. I'll come to you, Sri Mulyani and Dramati, but Niels Annan wanted to come in on this. And if you could keep your answers quite succinct, because we've got lots of questions I, coming in. I, I just wanted to um, underline what the governor just said, and maybe adding that even for a rich country like Germany, fading out of coal required massive investment in the affected communities for reasons of social justice, but let me be very clear. If we lose in a democracy the support for the energy transition that is necessary, you can create a contrary effect. And I believe that's true for the developed countries, but that's especially true for the developing countries. And that's why I believe the just energy transition partnerships and also the ETM where Germany is supporting President Marser is so of crucial importance and, and there shouldn't be seen as a contradiction but we need to think that together and it's a great challenge for both the practitioners in the development banks but also for the political leaders. So, Sri well, yeah. This is fit very well because when President Massa mentioned about energy transition mechanism and this is one of the examples in Indonesia and retiring coal earlier, what does it mean? If you have 20 years contract and you are going to uh, cut into half, then within these 10 years that you are going to cut this, what is going to happen with all the worker as well as the business related to this uh, uh, power sector. And that's why it is very important not just making a speech and then creating a policy that you are going to remove coal and then go to the renewable. You really have to look at all this environmental, social, as well as the governance implication on that. And this is exactly what we are doing by looking and picking one project. Okay, this coal power plant is going to be retired earlier. Then we are going to be able to identify what is going to be affected to this community as well as worker. What kind of program that you need to design in order for you to be able to have a more social harmony or transition which is smooth because it can create a political backlash both at the local level as well as national level. At the business level you actually can have a much more uh, easier to discuss because usually all these business players they can then jump into a new renewable energy project which is for them it is something that they can do it very quickly. Another thing is, of course, uh, the, the work on skilling, upskilling, reskilling, especially on the labor side. Yeah. This need not just providing a course, but you really look at what is going to be the labor market in the future. When the economy is going to change quite dramatically, who is going to be left behind? And this is something which is very, very critical yeah. for us to have the affirmative policy like Minister Nirmala mentioned. So a lot of work, it seems like you're talking about climate, but now you are end up with social program, you have also labor policy that need to be put it into one integrated policy framework right, within just, those energy. Very quick, a brief comment on that since you talk about jobs, um, Sri Mulyani. What policies are needed to support decent work of older people in Asian countries, of whom there are many, of course, and formalize the informal work of older people? I mean, we're seeing Asian populations in several Asian countries. Well, the aging population on the one hand, but if you look at the Asia, it's actually quite a good mix. You have the aging population like Japan, uh, mm. China in this case, but you also have a very young demographic yeah. like India and Indonesia, which is also equally big. Sure. So, as I said, then Asia is quite an interesting destination, as Chang Yong Ri mentioned. We are very dynamic. If you talk about the aging population, the first thing that you are trying to do is to address this productivity declining and whether you are going to allow labor coming from outside your country, so the immigration policy is very important, then you are going to then decide what kind of so social implication of this immigration. Yeah. But you cannot replace people. 
Okay. Meaning you can replace by a robot, but I really don't know. Now the artificial intelligence is so smart that you can really replace all the people. I don't know if you something. saw yeah. there were the comments. But the young of... demographic like <laughs> India and yeah. Indonesia maybe have a different policy challenge that yeah. is investing in human capital, especially on education skill, is going to be very important. Yeah. So you cannot say like Asia as one homogeneous community, uh, yeah. community or country. It's a slight sidebar, but we were all very interested in the comments of Jeffrey Hinton, who oh. just resigned from Google. Mm -hmm. He's known as the exactly. godfather of AI, mm -hmm. and uh, he has expressed his real fears about mm -hmm. where AI could take us all and actually, you know, supersede humans in, in many aspects so anyway that's a bit of a sidebar um, one question which has got a lot of votes um, moving to the big giant how will China's reopening influence the region's prospects of course we've seen China reopen after COVID we saw in 2021 how growth really plummeted in, in China picked up a bit I think to 3% last year and it's projected to be about 5% this year so maybe I'll give that one to you President Massa so how will it um, impact on the region? Okay, uh, obviously China's economic you know, prospects uh, have a huge, huge implication uh, for this region as a whole. And as uh, Zeno just mentioned, uh, in 2021, uh, China's growth rate was 8.4%, and it fell uh, sharply uh, in 2022 to 3% uh, due to a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, due to the very stringent uh, zero corona policy they adopted at that time, and uh, second, uh, because due to the, you know, some challenges they were facing and still they are facing in the real estate sectors and so on. And now they have officially exited uh, from stringent uh, zero corona policy. So this year, in 2023, uh, we strongly expect that Chinese uh, economy will recover. Uh, our ADO uh, predicts 5.0% uh, uh, this year, which is uh, identical uh, to the government target uh, for this year as well. Uh, this is a very good sign uh, for uh, you know, commodity exporting countries to China and also for the countries uh, who have a close uh, uh, economic linkage in terms of uh, uh, supply chain network, uh, in terms of uh, tourism, and so on. And our simulation says, on average, a percentage point higher growth uh, from the baseline in PRC, uh, China, uh, will boost exports. Now, this could drive faster average growth rates across emerging Asia by 0.3 percentage point in 2023 and 0.1 percentage point in 2024. Uh, so that's what we are expecting right now. But just one thing we have to bear in mind uh, maybe is that uh, you know, if Chinese economy will end up with even stronger uh, growth rate uh, than we are currently predicting, uh, which is 5.0, then that might provide additional inflation pressure on crude oil and also other mm. uh, commodity prices. So it could increase energy yes, prices. Yes, yes. This kind of upside risk uh, we have to bear in mind. So a slight down. But just a very quick point uh, to you as well, or to anybody else, is that we are seeing sluggish growth in the euro area, in the United States, in Japan as well. And that is going to have an impact on developing Asia because there'll be less demand for goods from these regions. So uh, that's also something to um, bear in mind mm. we'll just take that as an aside from me um, all right what other questions have we got here who would like to answer this it's got a lot of votes how can small economies recover in the light of heightened debt burdens built up during the pandemic i know you mentioned uh, uh, debt uh, honorable nirmala sid haraman anybody want to add anything on that particular point how small countries what did you yeah you've spoken on that so maybe okay briefly sri Mulyani. But I think um, all countries is using uh, a lot of fiscal space uh, during this pandemic. Uh, of course, different for, from country to country, but if you uh, initially is in a very high debt, then with this uh, pandemic, it's creating even more exposure. And this is exactly what happened to many 60 countries now under a very high debt distress. So the question is how you are going to be able to like recover. The recovery, uh, which is, Mainly, as Tang Yong mentioned, if you rely on monetary and fiscal policy, then it's going to worsen your fiscal position. So the most difficult part at this very moment for many countries actually how you are going to be able to create a fiscal consolidation 
without jeopardizing the recovery of the economy? The answer is very, very clear. Structural policy. And this is not immediately have the result in terms of the capital inflow or investment, but this is a very important policy reform or activity that need to be done by the government. So yes, I think at this very moment, at the global level, within the G20, ADB, World Bank, IMF, they try to address this issue of the debt distressed country. Yeah. On the other hand, maybe for this multilateral institution, for many low-income countries, their net capital inflow is very important. So how they are going to be able to get lending more without worsening their uh, situation, the fiscal situation, mm -hmm. especially when the interest rate is becoming so yeah. expensive at yeah. this very moment. The role of the multilateral institution becoming even more critical for those countries. Okay. Mr. Rhee, the alternate governor for the Republic of Korea. I think I do not have much things to add, as Sri Mulyan just said, but my past uh, close to nine years' experience at the IMF actually taught me there are two key things to resolve this issue. One is country ownership. The fact that you have a debt problem implies that there is a mismanagement of macro policies and mismanagement of the economic policies in certain uh, extent. So the country who has to restructure the debt has to accept the bullet and take some loss and politically accept the reform and move on. You know, you, we can you know, move the horse to the pond, but if horse refuses to drink, it's very hard to do the, any debt restructuring. So ownership is important. Second, I think there is a debt, there is a need for the debt relief. So that's why international organization, and with the, including the multilateral institution, has to provide some room for the debt restructuring so that the country with ownership can restart uh, again. Okay. Uh, Sri Mulyani mentioned interest rate hikes. We've had fewer in the region, actually, than elsewhere in the world. But one question here, which is when will interest rate hikes end in Asia? Anybody want to answer that? Oh, you wanted to do jobs, yeah, didn't yeah. you? But Look, I... Okay, I, I'm sorry, yes, you're I, right. I, I, Did I come to you I, on I jobs? cannot... Um, <laughs> as I'm not representing the Treasury Department from Germany, I have to be very cautious in what I'm saying here. But, um, yeah, but uh, I, I just wanted to add to, to the previous question, if you may, just one observation which should be of concern to us um, is that many of the developing instruments that we have been developing, addressing, among others, climate change, but not only climate change, are still based on concessional loans. But even those concessional loans, because of the ongoing situations, are getting more and more, you know, refused. Um, so that should, us, uh, should indicate how urgent the situation is, and it really needs to be addressed. That's maybe within the jurisdictions that I have is what I can say and want to say. Yeah. Good, okay. Anybody want to pick up the interest rate hikes? It looks like there's a central know? bank question. Yes. I think in Asia, if you uh, focus on Asia, as I mentioned, countries in a very different situation. Yeah. Maybe Japan may need to consider their low interest policy, so it may go to a different direction in the future. I don't know how long it's going to take. But uh, in case of my country, our inflation is going down. Last month, uh, in April, inflation is now moved below uh, 4%, 3.7%. But still, core inflation is around 4%. The Philippine governor is here, and he is very similar situation. So it looks like uh, there are several Asian countries whose inflation is going down, but still well above the target level. So I think it's a little bit premature to say when uh, we're going to pivot. At this moment, we may need to have a little bit longer period of high inflation to make sure that inflation is under control. Then we can move on uh, to think about uh, pivot later. Right, OK. Uh, a couple of questions on the geopolitics, so maybe I'll give those to you, Neil Zanen, because of your uh, foreign affairs um, uh, mandate in the past, which is what can be done to reconnect in a sustainable manner amidst regional and global tensions? And one that's related to that is also um, what can, given the complexity of geopolitical tensions and the difficulty to resolve them, how can countries better cooperate to develop global public goods? So questions there about cooperation, but amidst a difficult global yeah. background. Look, we, we have been um, trying to shed more attention on global public goods, also in the role of developing banks. 
and I believe we, we should have that discussion. We are sometimes looking, you know, w with a country focus on certain problems, and we need to be aware that it's not usually a single country faced with the problem that is shaping the global agenda. And that's a technical challenge, but it's also a question of how policymakers are looking at the problem. And I can only repeat, I mean, the uh, COVID has been mentioned. Many societies are still under severe stress and suffering from the economic impact. Um, we have a SDG summit coming up where we will have a kind of half-time review. And everybody here, I think, knows that the result will be devastating at best. So um, if there is no political will to find a basic consensus to move ahead on the agreed agenda of the United Nations, then we are going to be in big trouble. And I believe also the background as a, as a politician, a member of parliament, multilateral development banks are usually not as politicized as other fora. And that's an asset. It's a way to bring decision makers, very relevant decision makers together and, and defend you know, that basic consensus that we need. And, and maybe so, it's getting more political, if you like it or not, President Massa, but the role is going to be more important and I think we should support that. Mm. Anybody else want to come in? I think with? I can yes, add really just, uh, based on the experience of uh, presiding the G20, especially on the finance track, the finance minister and the central bank governor, we usually try to say, okay, there is a global politics, there is a geopolitical tension, but can we discuss more on a technocratic and technical problem. And the issue of climate change is, if you put it within the context of now the geopolitics, interestingly, the sustainable finance within the G20 co-chaired by two largest economy, which is having this tension, that is US and China. So that's why on a sustainability, climate change and finance, we actually can have quite a lot of common objective and more technical discussion, aside from the geopolitical tension. So within the context of finance ministers as well as central bank governor, I think we can always create room for this cooperation. When the politic relatively then put a little bit remove, removed from us, and then we can uh, dig down into a more technical level. With that, usually then communication, collaboration can be then bridged, then we are going to be, hopefully, can create a much better result. Of course, at the end of the day, it is a political decision, but uh, you cannot just giving up by not doing anything. You're smiling. Do you want to say anything no, about no, this? I do agree. You agree with it, yeah. And, okay, all right, we'll go on to more questions. Um, so this one is, uh, has got quite a few votes. What can MDBs do to encourage countries to reduce trade protectionism, especially for food and fertilizers? Anybody want to answer that one? What would you expect from the MDBs? Yeah, uh, no well, if you're talking one. about uh, food and uh, food-related, yeah. insecurity-related issues, it is the WTO largely, World Trade Organization, which is largely the institution that <coughs> comes into debate. And uh, I don't want to talk, uh, talk global north-south politics, but no, global north-south politics is the one which makes this question relevant. Global north-south politics, since I think uh, the time when WTO was founded, has had this little um, grievance that export of agricultural produce and also generally the trade, the voice of the South or voice of the emerging markets has not been heard at par with the voice of the developed countries. And why do I say this? Subsidies 
for agriculture becomes critical for many of our economies. But those subs subsidies didn't get counted at all. They were frozen at some point in time. Now, I would think in the context of COVID and in the context of the Russia-Ukraine war, and legitimately all of us feeling very, very sensitive about food security, fertilizer security. Why is fertilizer security important? Because it feeds into food security. We'll all have to be talked again in the WTO with a rather open mind. Otherwise, even with food security completely well established in developed countries, many parts of the world, they even today are not sure will they get their stock of wheat coming next, even if they are willing to pay for it. The transit of goods from one part of the world itself has become difficult to the other part of the world. So insecurity leading towards uh, starvation is not something which the world would have thought about. Um, in the last century, we thought we had uh, milk uh, mountains, or milk rivers or butter mountains and uh, granary of uh, wheat. The, the lopsided way in which trade agreements have come about yeah. and the World Trade Organization is trying to grapple with this situation, but sooner the solution found better it is for the global mm. food sector. I mean, Ngozi okonjo iwela who of course is Nigerian, she, she, a, a Director yes, General of the yes. WTO, has very much got this on her radar. That's right, and she's very sensitive to, yeah. to these issues, thankfully, yeah. and therefore I'm sure she will be able to resolve these issues. Yeah, but I mean, you're very right, the, the issue of food insecurity it ha is a huge one, and we see it in developing Asia, and I know that the Asian Development Bank is pledging to support, I think it's $14 billion yeah. of food assistance yeah. between 22 and 25 yeah. to um, those in need in, in the region. I don't know if you want to add anything more on that, or, or Niels Annen wants to yeah, come I, in here. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to, to mention the ADB's um, uh, crucial role there, but as the question was of the general tra question yeah, about trade protection what MDBs yeah. can do, just very briefly mention the um, the uh, Global Alliance on Food Security that we um, proposed during the G7 presidency, which then was um, supported in this case by the World Bank and other international institutions. Uh, and I, I think, I don't want to elaborate too much on that, but, but we have been able to create a global food security dashboard uh, gathering information which is out there, but not always available to the um, decision makers. So that's just one out of many examples, but I think the urgency is more than obvious on that issue. Mm. Anybody else want to come in on this? No, all right. Um, a question for you here, um, Governor Reid. Um, Korea's development model has been successful. We can all see that. So what can Asia learn from Korea and how can it avoid its challenges? <laughs> I, well, yeah, I know. A whole blueprint there reduced to just a couple of minutes, but do your best. I think this, this, I have to, you know, really, people can have quite different view. And uh, I myself find that the uh, uh, Korea case is a rare, uh, rare example, unfortunately, because I was working at the ADB. I was in, also in Washington, D.C., in IMF. When I look at the history of development, unfortunately, we cannot find many. So if I mention a few things, I have to thank our old, you know, my father generation. The corruption was much milder. I wouldn't say we are zero corruption, but I say that when I look at the other part of the world, uh, low-income country, corruption was much, mild, much heavier. So I think the corruption was very critical. And uh, fortunately, we had uh, very sound macro policies in the beginning. For example, we have a capital control in the beginning. This is one, just one example. But when I see many other develop, developing countries in a very low uh, stage of development, there are many incentives for the rich businessmen to bring the money out. But at the time, uh, our government was very harsh on the capital outflow. That actually contribute to the recycling of, the, uh, 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 of the, our savings to fund our infrastructure. At the same time, I have to say that we are the, in some sense 
beneficiary of the Cold War period mm. because at that time Korea was avant-garde of capitalism mm. and there is a more support from the multilateral institution mm. including the ADB and then with the less corruption we use it very wisely mm. and then I can uh, say that the quality of our education and the quality of our civil service servant was uh, very higher uh, later on they are so you know capable so we become a government-led growth model that has a pros and cons but in the beginning uh, the high quality of mm. civil servant uh, with less corruption was a uh, very if you ask me how we achieve these things i don't know i, I try know, to answer yeah, but, it's but incredible incredible though, things it? but i think uh, yeah I mean, in the early 60s, the per capita income in, in South Korea, in the Republic of Korea, was lower than several African countries. And now you look where you are, but it's very interesting. You highlight good governance, good administration. Obviously, external help was, as you say, very critical, particularly um, from the United States and um, a good education hard -working. system. Hard working. Hard working. Yeah, because you know, when I see my, I work harder, but if I compare with my parents, I'm enjoying my life. And when I look at the, my children, they are enjoying my life, in their life more. Are they working less than you then? The young well, children? Working less is a good thing, but the, my point is that the, at the initial stages, we really work hard. And yeah. we have to be grateful for our old generation to lay the ground. Interesting, very interesting. Anybody else want to pick up on whether Korea's development model has lessons well, for the region? Yes, Sri Mulyani. Zhang Liang is very humble in uh, trying to sharing the development experience, but we have to admit that the Korean model of development has become one of the best examples mm -hmm. for ASEAN country as well as other. Uh, what is interesting, what he said first, on the macro side, there is the prudent macro policy has become necessary condition. I think that means you put the fiscal monetary policy and policy framework in order because they can become source of problem rather than source of solution. But then it will not adequate. You are talking about the trade policy, investment policy, education policy, including investing in the infrastructure in this case. Uh, President mentioned uh, this morning on the opening that uh, the expressway from Seoul to Incheon was developed by ADB. I think many countries then can identify what is the building block of all this success that is on the infrastructure trade policy which is open investment policy attracting more capital and you investing in human capital education mm. and health and then the last thing is the ingredient is governance i mean yeah. you cannot like just have a good macro policy and then all this trade investment education health and then building infrastructure it can be easily damaged or destroyed when the governance is not in place. So the regulatory yeah. reform on putting the governance in place, good governance, I think is going to be important. Yeah. That is maybe the short history of South Korea, according to me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. And capital flight, the lack of capital exactly. flight, which meant that the money being made in the country yeah. was invested in the country. And yeah. uh, capital flight, of course, is... Uh, still a big issue um, all over the world but fascinating you, you see you did very well just in a couple of minutes you mm -hmm. said oh <laughs> i can't answer that question in that time but you did um there's a, a question here that's um, got some votes which is there is a proposal to create a forum for mdbs to discuss progress and actions on climate finance back on climate finance could this help achieve the global climate goals um Niels Allen, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but specifically a forum for MDBs. Do you think that's something that would work? I mean, the World Bank under its outgoing president, David Malpass, was uh, attracted some criticisms for not doing enough on climate action, and his um, successor, Ajay Banga, is being urged to do more. Yeah. Oh, well, it, the result is important, not another forum. Um, not another forum. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not against another meeting, but I, I think um, uh, the debates are affecting all the multilateral development banks, and we're already seeing that. Um, I mean, there's no isolated discussion, as there shouldn't be. Um, so I, I, I'm always a little bit hesitant to create new institutions. Uh, I, I think yeah. we are fully capable of doing 
the job that is necessary right now. But the crucial thing is not to lose what I see as a certain momentum right now. And that has to do with the global um, political tensions that we addressed several times here yeah. on that, on that um, podium. And I believe that's responsibility of the governors here, of the, the, uh, yeah. the governments that are engaged and that are, that are pushing that agenda forward, uh, that, that we are not, you know, uh, Placent with the situation and self-congratulatory, mm. uh, we're not there yet. And I mm. think that's true for the World Bank. I also believe it's true for the ADB, mm. although a lot has been done. Um, but I don't know if we need a new institution. I don't think we need another forum. Yeah, we have. Does everybody agree we don't really need a new forum? Well, that's the answer to that question. Whoever proposed it, you've heard the answer here. Um, there's uh, now the issue of inequality is a very important one we've touched on it inequality within countries and between countries in the asia pacific recent regions so there is a question here which is how can we tackle rising societal inequalities including in developed economies in asia that may be something that all of you may want to um, touch on anybody want to kick off on that one how do you tackle societal inequalities all right, Thank you. No. As a finance minister, of course, the tools on the fiscal side and addressing the inequality, whether this is on the revenue side, that is the tax policy, you have the design of the income tax, whether they are progressive enough so that you are going to be able to make uh, this contribution or reducing the inequality without jeopardizing or damaging the basic uh, motivation or innovation that is going to be like uh, in place need to be also. This is a very important balance. You also choose many of your instruments within your revenue side, whether this is going to be income tax on the corporate, personal income tax, whether you are VAT and other like the land tax, property tax. These are all very important instruments when you're talking about inequality. On the spending side, as a finance minister, you actually also can choose. I mean, a lot of countries now adopting, for example, targeted subsidy because it's very important. So those which is really in need, whether this is on a food subsidy, whether this is based on poverty, whether you are trying to cut the intergenerational poverty reduction through whatever education support, health support, I think that can be done through this expenditure side. Mm. And then you also have the ability, for example, like in Indonesia, because you have also natural resources, commodity-based economy, how you are going to use this booming of this commodity when you receive the revenue, you investing it in those areas which is lagged mm. behind, the poorest, the farthest, the most remote, and especially for those the vulnerable like women and children. Yeah. So these are all within the fiscal tools, there mm. are a lot of what you call it instrument that you could do in order for you to be able to reduce the inequality within country. Across country, well, a decade ago, I think the World Bank, ADB, they are all optimistic that there will be a convergence, meaning that low-income country, middle-income country growing much faster than the advanced country, meaning that they are catching up. Mm. But now with this pandemic mm. and now with the digital technology, mm. with geopolitics mm. and climate change, it's actually affecting worse for many of the low-income countries. Yeah, so what we are afraid, this is going to create a lot of setback because of this shock. Going backwards, yeah, it is very worrying. Um, Neil Zanen? Yeah, maybe uh, one, one aspect that I think we should consider in that debate, when we look what um, happened during COVID to those countries who had virtually no health, public health system or very weak public health systems, but you can maybe even talk about basic social protection flaw. The result was you pushed more people into poverty but also from the economic point of view, there was sometimes close to zero capacity to adapt to an external shock. So what we in the developed countries could use as an automatic stabilizer was simply not available to many countries. So I think one of the um, consequences of that 
is that we need to invest in, in public systems of health, but also on a, a basic social protection floor. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're seeing lots of countries support, uh, withdraw their pandemic support measures, which has had a real impact on those the poorest. Do you, do you think one question related is, uh, would conditional cash transfers to the poorest perhaps help as one of the measures? It has helped in India, at least yeah. during the COVID, because um, like uh, the initial part of the discussion placed a lot of emphasis on system reforms. We did not just talk about short-term monetary policy, fiscal policy, long-term, but we also placed a lot of emphasis on system reforms, the long-term reforms that you so require. In India, luckily because we had these reforms undertaken, we had this digital economy boom and also we facilitated with digital identity markers for people, as a result of which, during the pandemic, even when economies were writing checks and posting it by the mail, we were able to transfer money directly into the accounts of the poor. And now also, therefore, the question comes, how are you going to wean it out? And that has to be calibrated. Mm. But even more, talking about the uh, bridging the gap between the widening gap uh, between the you know rich and the poor and also um, are we going to lose out on this race and I love the gap to widen uh, there should be conscious efforts made to provide like Sri Mulyani explained revenue moving to capital expenditure there should be an emphasis for capital expend expenditure to widen you spend through the government for creating assets when you do that, you immediately benefit the labor, benefit those who depend on semi-skills that they have, they're not fully skilled. So you're able to pump in wages through the, that route, one. And by creating assets, you're also creating a better multiplier for the money that you're spending on these issues. Mm. But larger debate remains, and it is applicable even to developed countries, is that every attempt will have to be made to widen your GDP with newer areas of activity for which you need to give support. Today, the economy does not just de depend on the classical narrative of primary, secondary, and tertiary sector. Now, ter tertiary has come to mean so much more. The service sector, not just IT-driven, but even otherwise the service sector is helping a lot of our economies, particularly those which have younger population. So widening the GDP through various other um, uh, segments of ac activity, giving them that uh, additional skills will be so essential. Mm. Completely, thank you. So um, we're coming to the end of the session, actually. I mean, a couple of questions here that we probably don't have time to answer. What are policymakers doing to prepare for the next pandemic? We're just getting over this one. You have to think about the next one, but I'm sure it's on your radar. And then a question again about climate finance is predominantly made up of debt. How does the Asian Development Bank ensure that its climate finance has the highest impact while not further worsening the debt situation of its most vulnerable members? I think we've touched on that too. So let's just round up the uh, governor's seminar and I just want to come to all of you. We've discussed um, this afternoon a range of policy issues to support Asia's uh, rebound and also identified some very, very clear risks. But if I were to ask you to just highlight, you know, one particular course of action or a policy that you think absolutely must be done as soon as possible, what would you say? Well, Governor Reid, yeah, me. Mr. Reid. Ah, okay. Uh, the others have got time to think <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> going to you no, first, it's, it's not fair, yeah. yes. Pa partly because of my job, I think Asia countries has, our trade side, real sector side is very much integrated. But on the other hand, our financial side is not well integrated and our savings are still going abroad even we are talking about green bond investment actually there are not many green bonds for example ourselves so i think uh, we have to be more innovative as uh, uh, mass uh, uh, president mentioned and then we have to try more on the financial integration of asia uh, as a kind of source for the new growth 
financial institution financial, of Asia. Yeah. Especially payment side and settlement side yeah. and financial market overall. I think that's where that we can have a more advanced. I mean, that whole kind of regional integration mm -hmm. and the, you know, global, the supply chains and so on is absolutely critical. But with your finance hat on, the financial integration is the key thing for you. Thank you. Srimali Ali Indrawati? Well, I think the ASEAN can invest more on improving or increasing productivity. I think this is the most important uh, issue for our countries. And productivity improvement is the most sustainable source of growth in this case. So it sounds maybe not sexy or interesting, but it is important, whether this is on education, whether you are talking about labor scale, whether you are talking about macro policy, which is not distorting toward a more uh, less productive activity, or even investing in an infrastructure, which is going to be also important for improving the mobility and productivity. So these are all the area which is big enough platform that is productivity, productivity, and productivity. I think that is going to sustain the rebound of the Asia after pandemic, as well as the answer of many of these debt problem uh, and maybe also cooperation among countries. Even though we might see a slowdown, as I said, for the demands of that productivity, productivity, productivity. Well, the demand side can be created when you are investing more on a productivity in which then you have generating people with earning, which is supported by true productivity. It will not create a bubble and their demand, that is their activity to consume, it will create another uh, growth or recovery which is more better quality and sustainable. President Massa, you wanted to come in specifically on this because I'm yeah. going to come to you for the last word, but yes. Uh, Did you want to come in specifically on this? Really. I'll no, come no, to you for the last word, I think, yeah, because I'm just going in order here. So, Nirmala Sitharaman, what would you seek to emphasize? Um, well, two things I would think. There should be greater digital integration of economies. We saw a globalization phase. Now there is going to be a re-globalization. It's not as if you're going back on globalization. We need to re-energize globalization with slightly different terminology. But at the same time, there has to be digital globalization. Unless countries and their systems talk with each other and the uh, neighboring countries, for instance, to start with, talk to each other's uh, digital platforms, the benefits of technology making life easy for citizens, particularly common citizens, will never be achieved. Now you have a lot of migration of labor. People move to different parts of the country, but still they keep their roots intact. Yeah. And I can speak for India and I can speak for Philippines. I'm sure the minister is here. So repatriations have helped economies sustain themselves. Yeah. Now, it is becoming even more expensive nowadays to repatriate. Yeah. But what technology has done to us is that cross-border transfers are becoming easier. And with that, economies survive and prosper, just as this labor who has gone, or the specialist who has gone abroad, is serving that economy as well. Cross-border should become simplified. Second, within a country, at least there should be a lot more Democrat, uh, democratizing of enterprise. Yeah. The on, entrepreneurial skills will have to be a lot more widespread right. within the country, no scaling up for some few sure. to become big and the others not. Conscious of time, thank you. Just a, a minute or two for you, uh, Neil Zanin. Yeah, thank what you. would you as, highlight? As I, uh, I want to hear what President Massa has to say very briefly, I think uh, showing that the Just Energy Transition Partnership really works would be a major breakthrough and could create a new dynamic that I think could um, really have an economic and sustainable impact on the countries here in the region. So President Massa, you've heard what the governors have said in this session and so on. What are your closing thoughts and what would you like to emphasize? Okay, uh, before that, uh, let me pick up one thing, yes, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I would like to really emphasize, which has not been discussed today, which is uh, domestic resource mobilization. Oh, there was a question about that, actually, oh, there, uh, DRM, yes, but uh, we were running yeah, out of time. Yeah, it's called DRM, and uh, uh, briefly, you know, uh, governments in our region has been really suffering from uh, quite un uh, unexpected uh, 
accumulation of public debt and shrinking tax revenues. And uh, for example, COVID-19 uh, clearly exposed uh, the need for substantial amount of investment in health sector, uh, education sector, and uh, social protection um, uh, mechanisms. Uh, definitely, uh, we need a more predictable and stable uh, revenue flows. And th those kind of revenue flows should come from domestically, domestic resource mobilization, rather than relying too much on external financing. Yeah. If you look at tax to GDP ratio uh, or, uh, in our region, which the figures are relatively low, uh, lower than the, the other part of the world, uh, which means your know, tax policy uh, should be uh, improved uh, to uh, raise more tax revenue. And also uh, tax administration, especially tax collection function, uh, can be uh, make, made more you know, efficient and uh, uh, effective. Uh, by, for example, utilizing uh, digital technology. Right, well, what could you answer that question? Is enough being done on mobilizing domestic resource mobilization? Thank you. And we just have a, a couple of minutes before we end this session. I, I don't know if you've got any parting shots or okay. final thoughts. Yeah. Okay, so let me start uh, by thanking my fellow panelists uh, for the rich discussion and Zena uh, for expertly uh, guiding the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, sharing our experience will help us to identify policies to resolve the complex issues facing our region. Our recently published ADO, Asian Development Outlook, uh, noted uh, that the region is poised to continue its recovery in spite of the recent shocks. Uh, recently released first quarter GDP figures from the PRC, uh, People Republic of China, aligns with uh, this cautious optimism. But the region continues to face enormous challenges. Let me emphasize, in particular, that development is no longer possible without effective climate action. Without effective climate action. ADB stands ready to help our members make the transition to a net zero future and to ensure that communities can adapt to uh, climate events. We must take corrective action on these issues. As a climate bank for Asia and Pacific, Pacific ADB will support our development member countries through innovative finance, knowledge, and partnerships to help solve the uh, climate crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, President Massa. Thank you to all the uh, governors in this session. Thank you to you for your attention. It's been my pleasure being with all of you. Enjoy the rest of the annual uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Governor. Thank you.